Good morning. Um, my name is Elmer, and this is my wife, Kim, and uh, we will be sharing our testimony with you today, this morning. Um, when I was asked to share my testimony of how I became a Christian, I didn't know what to say at first. I was raised a Christian since birth, no dramatic transformation, no 180 degree life changes. Ever since I was old enough to attend school, memory verses and classroom prayers were routine. Little did I know my, that life can toss you around and test your faith. Uh, I've attended vacation Bible school, school retreats, even signed my name to a true love waits contract promising to keep myself pure until marriage. I've even dedicated my life a couple of times to becoming a pastor. I, on the other hand, did not grow up with a Christian background, but in another faith. My family considered themselves as CEOs, Christmas and Easter only. Going to, sco going to school and attending Mass every once in a while made me compartmentalize my faith. In my younger years, I was molested and didn't tell anybody. I was trapped and my only escape was reading depressing books. In high school, I lost my virginity early, and at that time, proudly, as I was amongst the first out of my friends. This was the beginning of my collections of boyfriends. Some were nice and some not so nice. Coming out of high school, I was exposed to the more secular parts of the world. I had a girlfriend, even though my parents advised me not to have one until after college. But she was a pastor's kid, and that's how I justified it. Despite being in a relatively Christian relationship, we were sexually immoral and did not please God. Uh, during fourth grade, I too was molested by one of my scout masters and never told anyone, not even my parents. This caused me to see sex as something very taboo and mysterious and I started to have cravings for this and got addicted to pornography and sex. The effects of the abuse started showing up when I hurt my then girlfriend deeply by being unfaithful um, and ultimately alienated many of our common friends. This was the start of my downward spiral. It was the neediness and desperation that drove my, a lot of my boyfriends away. In college, it was one boyfriend in particular that took hold of my life, calling me stupid and said that I wasn't smart enough to be a doctor. But I loved him. I was so desperate for his attention that I swallowed half a bottle of sleeping pills because he wouldn't talk to me after we had a fight. The next thing I know, I wake up in the hospital and after stabilizing me, was escorted um, to the psychiatric ward and stayed there for four days. After my mental breakdown, my boyfriend broke up with me and I decided to go to medical school in the Philippines, not only to chase my dreams, but also to leave my life of misery. Starting medical school, I grew further and further away from the faith. Without a discipleship group or D group and accountability to guide me, I started to love the world. Um, getting drunk during parties were commonplace. I would have immoral relationships left and right, and my conviction to live like Christ was non-existent. I even ended up ruining some friendships in the process. Um, when I met Kim, I was in second year of medical school, and at this point, I didn't care if she was a Christian or not. We started dating and continued on like how the world perceived relationships to be. Um, we lived together and hid it for my parents. I heard that Elmer was a good Christian boy before we started dating, and in truth, it turned me off a little. He would ask me to come to CCF with him, and inwardly, I would roll my eyes. I mean, God wasn't there for the first half of my life. Why would I want to go to church now? I remember the first time that I did finally cave in and attended one of the worship services. It was a segment on forgiveness, a mother who was able to forgive her son's murder, murder who was, which astonished me. I mean, forgive a murderer? How absurd. But as I began to attend more services, I realized that forgiveness didn't mean that I was a weakling, but it meant that I was free. I was able to forgive all, if not most, of the people in my earlier life for what they have done, even my molester. Little did I know it was I who also needed forgiveness. Less than a year of dating Elmer, I flew back home to California and had a one night stand with my ex-boyfriend. Yes, the one who led me to the mental breakdown. Elmer was devastated and he forgave me miraculously. It was one of the most painful things in the world. 
Um, this gave me a dose of my own medicine. I questioned my faith, but God had me go through this pain to shape me into a better person, a better husband. I forgave Kim after about three months of praying, healing, and mending. This made us such a strong. This made us much stronger as a couple, and we both felt it was necessary to have gone th through this ordeal. Eventually, Kim started attending church with me, probably also from my mom, constantly inviting her. But it came to a point in our faith that going to church was a chore and did it only to please my mom. However, I still felt a tug of conviction that a Christian family was what I longed for. Although at this point, I thought it was too late. I gave up sharing the gospel to Kim and just decided to live a non-God-centered marriage. I flew to the US to finally tie the knot I came on her birthday to surprise her, but we ended not seeing each other in the airport. I was stopped at immigration and they found out that I was marrying Kim by looking through my luggage and my planner. I had no choice but to withdraw my entry and was put, back, uh, was put on the next flight back to the Philippines. This was God's plan all along. I was depressed, embarrassed, and did not know what to do next. I was thinking this was God's way of hindering me from marrying Kim. A few months later, Kim decided to come to the Philippines. The church-going chores continued, but one Sunday, my mom's D-group mate offered to sponsor us to the True Life Retreat in Laguna. Kim and I were hesitant, but went ahead. We felt bad to reject the kind gesture. The True Life Retreat opened my eyes to what was there, what is there, and what will be. I was struggling to fill the void that burrowed so deep into my heart and worried that I couldn't find anything big enough, massive enough to fill it. It was also around that time that I found out I failed one of my board exams and was actually starting to believe that I really was stupid and I really wasn't going to make it. The retreat's presence pushed aside my preoccupation of my failure. I began singing the songs and internalizing the messages. Slowly but surely, I began to know more about Jesus and came to the conclusion that I want to have a relationship with him. It was in this retreat where God revealed his plan. Kim accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior and even got baptized. In the retreat, Kim wrote me a note thanking me for bringing her to Christ and that she decided to follow him with all her heart. Tears began to fall and I realized that this was where God was leading us all along. It has never been the same ever since. Being deported was one of the best blessings I've ever received. We both agreed to undergo premarital counseling to establish our marriage under God. On January 21st, we were equally yoked under God in front of all our friends and family. It was the best feeling in the world, knowing that at that moment, God was in control. Since then, Jeremiah 29, verse 11, has been the verse that has guided and surrounded our marriage. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God had another thing planned for both of us. We weren't really part of any discipleship groups. God saw this and decided to change that. A few months later, things at home were gaining some friction. My relationship with my father-in-law had become challenging, and as a couple, we planned to move to my aunt's place in Chicago. After speaking to my aunt and telling her we would be there in about two to three weeks, we found out that CCF San Francisco was established. So we went one Sunday and, introduced, and was introduced to everyone. We were invited to attend the Saturday night discipleship group, and we couldn't forget our first time there. Still shy and quiet, we ate dinner in a very discreet and hin manner, much more tame than how we do it now. <laughs> Yet, we instantly felt like we belonged to the group. There were no masks and no superficial formalities, just raw, straightforward love from one person to another. When we were driving home from the first night, first D group night, we were both quiet, absorbing this experience that God led us to. And at that point, this was the only thing that felt right in our lives. Being part of a D group led us to know God and experience his pure love. We went again for the next two weeks and decided to stay in California. We prayed to God about our decision and he imparted this. We now had a family, a family of believers that shared our love for God and each other, a family that taught us what it meant to be brothers and sisters in Christ. 
we had accountability. Someone to whip us back into God's design with love if we did start straying. Our faith was growing every week we came, just as our waistlines were. I realized that God allowed those things to happen in the past, to happen for, for the good, just like in Romans 8, 28. And we know the, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who, who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. If it's God, God's will that I do end up becoming a psychiatrist, I can only think of all the patients who have had similar experiences that I will not only be able to treat, but eventually to heal. Every time I think about our situation and what we've been through, I constantly get reminded of that verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. He has our lives plotted out. He said so himself. A lot of times it may seem like everything is a mess and it seems like God isn't doing anything to help. This is what, God, this is what the world tells me. But we live life rest assured that God is just breaking down old roads to make way for the best one. I am Elmer Labella. And I'm Kimberly Labella. And we, and we have both, both decided, decided to follow Jesus, Jesus no, no turning back. back. To, to God, God be all the glory. glory. Thank you, Kim and Elmer. Why don't we all pray for, for the two of them uh, as they've given us their testimony and courage us into their lives. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the life of Kim and, and Elmer and for the new identity that they have in you now. Father, we even thank you for the, uh, the past that they have. They're not, they're, they're not the, the same people now, Lord, but we thank you that you can use the past um, to lead others more into your kingdom. Father, I ask that you would continue to work in their life, that your Holy Spirit would empower them as they walk closely with you. Enrich their lives, Lord, with, uh, with your love, and ask that you continue to, to experience you um, moment by moment, to become more sensitive, Lord, to your leading, and to be energized by hope that can only be found in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for, for them being a part of us and us being a part of them. And together, Lord, we uh, commit that uh, we'll stir each other up and encourage one another to, to walk close, closely uh, in your word. So thank you, Father, for them in the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.